If you have ever labeled yourself a plant killer, or really if you've ever just killed a plant or if a plant has died under your care, it has likely been a result of a watering issue. In my experience, 90% of plant death happens because of overwatering, underwatering, or just plain old not understanding how to correctly water your houseplants. But I've got your back, plant friend. It's not as intuitive as we think it is. I always love to say, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And that's the purpose of this podcast, to empower you with all of the information you need to make the right choice to water any of the plants in your collection, not just one specific type. This isn't a watering guide for Calathea. This is a general how to water any type of houseplant so that no matter what plant comes into your home, you'll be ready. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Hello, plant friends. If you're new here, I'm Maria. I am your new best plant friend, and I help you care for plants successfully and grow joy in your life by doing so. And if you are a repeat listener, welcome home, my plant friend. It is so good to have you back and to grow with you, to grow joy with you today. We are coming back to our Growing Joy with Leaf Joy series, sponsored by Proven Winners Leaf Joy, the most amazing house plants. And today, the Growing Joy with Leaf Joy series has been primarily genus deep dive. So I hope you've gone back in the feed and you've listened to our episodes on alocasia, ficus, calathea, philodendron, right? But this Growing Joy with Leaf Joy series is all about how to empower you to care for plants successfully in order to grow joy. And a big part of that is watering. So I decided to dedicate an entire episode today to everything I have learned about watering in the last seven to eight years of caring for house plants. You might know some of this. I bet you walk away with one, at least one new fun fact about watering, at least one new watering tip, at least one new watering tool that you might not have in your toolkit. And it's going to be so fun. Because when you think about growing joy, watering, I feel like is one of the best plant life parallels, right? When you water your plants, water yourself, meaning as a literal reminder to drink water. But also when you're watering your plants, it's a great time to take a deep breath in this mindful moment with your plants and think, what areas of my life are parched? Where do I need to hydrate? What aspects of my life do I need to hydrate? So I'll wax poetic about plant life parallels forever, but we have an episode about watering today. So if you're interested in that, you can grab my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Happiness, which is a self-help book all about how to live a happier life with plants. Also, if you're a visual learner, we have a video companion to this podcast episode. So once we get into top watering, bottom watering, watering tools, If you want the visual to see what I'm talking about in this podcast to further support you as you grow, you can head over to our YouTube channel. It'll be linked in the show notes and it's also brought to you by Proven Winners Leaf Joy. So when talking about watering, this is a zoom out episode, right? Like I said, we're not talking about how to water orchids. We're talking about the importance of water. I'm kind of calling this the why, when, and how of watering houseplants, right? So we don't need the who, the who is the plants and we don't need the what because the what is the water. So why, when, and how? of watering houseplants. And when you know the why, when, and how of watering houseplants, you're basically going to be able to apply these skills to any plant that you have in your collection. So first off, let's start with the biggest high-level question. Why do we have to water our houseplants? Why do our houseplants need water? So obviously hydration, right? Plants are living things. We are living things. We need water for ourselves and for hydration, and so do plants. Water is also a huge part of photosynthesis, right? So the plant uses water and sunlight to create the sugar molecules, the carbs that the plant lives off of. So if you don't have water, the plant can't photosynthesize properly. So you need water. Another thing that for some people, this might not be as intuitive, but plants also need water to stand up, right? So when their cells are full, there's turgidity. Turgidity means like to stand upright. 
So often when you haven't watered a plant, you're going to see that it's wilted over. In part, that's because it's lost its turgidity. And when you give that plant a good water, the cells are full and they're able to stand back up, right? So oftentimes if you have a plant that's like toppling over and isn't doing well, it actually might be a watering issue and it actually might need a little bit more water to get that turgidity up so it can stand upright and proud and look for the sun or your grow light. Water is also a main form of nutrient uptake, right? So when we fertilize our houseplants, if you sprinkle, you know, fertilizer granules or if you add liquid fertilizer to your water, the water is the way that these nutrients are transported into the plant. So either the water is what activates the granules and the nutrients are released into the water and then the plant absorbs the water and absorbs the nutrients or you're feeding the plant with nutrient-enriched water, like if you use a liquid fertilizer the way I do, and then the roots absorb the water and the nutrients, and the nutrients get transported throughout the plant to help it grow and thrive. So that's the why. What about the how? How do plants absorb water, right? You water the soil, and then you just know that the, the plant gets hydrated, but how does that actually work? So Plants absorb the majority of the water that they need through their roots. There are some house plants that you can spritz and they can absorb water through their leaves. But with house plants, we're really not watering our plants that way. The way that your plants absorb water, the essence of their life, right? We need water to have happy house plants is through their roots. Their roots have root hairs. So if you look at a house plant root, a general aeroid houseplant root that's, you know, pink, kind of fleshy, you're going to see these tiny little hairs on the roots. Those hairs allow for water absorption. The roots then have pathways that move the water up the plant. And when we hear about overwatering and root rot, this is where the issue happens, right? So I used to do this all the time with my houseplant. So I'm prefacing this story and this educational moment by saying, if you have done this, you are still worthy. You are still amazing. It is no big deal. Everybody does this. Everybody overwaters a plant once or twice in their life. But I was overwatering my plants without knowing because I, I didn't understand this process. So in order to be happy and healthy, roots need water and air. They need access to air and they need access to water. So when you overwater a plant and there's too much water in the soil, either the soil doesn't have enough aeration or you're watering into a container that has no drainage, so the water ends up sitting at the bottom of the pot, if roots are in the soil that is completely saturated because the water has nowhere to go, the roots are essentially going to suffocate because the water is going to push out all of the air and the roots don't have air, so they're going to suffocate. They're going to root rot and die, right? So when a root is completely submerged in waterlogged soil, it's going to rot and it's going to die off and turn to mush. If you've ever touched a quote unquote rotten root, it like completely disintegrates in your hand. So I once had a variegated watermelon peperomia. It was like my most treasured plant. I overwatered it. The roots rotted. And then all of a sudden, they basically disappeared and evaporated into the soil, right? So I had this beautiful, robust plant on the top and no roots to support water uptake and nutrient uptake. So that plant sadly died because it had no roots. So when you hear overwatered a plant, that usually means the roots rotted out and then the plant no longer had roots for stability, for water uptake, for nutrient uptake, for the myriad of amazing things that roots do. So this is where overwatering and root rot can be a problem. And this is why I highly recommend using pots with drainage holes, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's the how do plants absorb water. And then last but not least, the when of how to water your houseplants. A lot of people get really confused about when to water their houseplants. Do you water every day? Do you water once a week? Do you water once a month? Do you have to water in the morning? Do you have to water in the evening? Like what are the watering rules? And Sadly, I wish I could just give you a prescription pad with one thing that everybody could apply to their houseplant collections, but it's really going to be a unique answer for everyone because an example I like to use is say we have two identical snake plants in a four inch pot. I keep a snake plant in my house and I give a snake plant to my friend in San Diego, California. My home in upstate New York is much lower light than the home of my friend in San Diego. So likely her snake plant is going to get a lot more light than my snake plant. And light 
is part of photosynthesis. So more light means more water needs, right? Less light needs less water needs. So my friend in San Diego is probably going to have to water her snake plant, same snake plant, but because of her indoor conditions, she's going to have to water it more than I'm going to need to water my snake plant. So I like to say you should water your plants thoroughly, but not necessarily frequently. So we'll talk about frequency in a minute. But what I mean is, When you water your houseplants, you want to mimic, you know, the way that they get watered outside, which is in a rainfall, right? So they don't get an ice cube worth of water. They don't get a little sip of water. They get a nice thorough drenching of water and then they wait until the next rain comes, right? So when you water your plant, you're going to want to water it thoroughly, which means that you're going to water it until water drips out of the bottom of the pot, the hole in the bottom of the pot. And that's when you'll know that, you know, the soil is properly saturated. You can do this via top watering or bottom watering, which we will talk about in a minute when we get into techniques. When it comes to frequency, errors that I see a lot of beginner plant parents make is they buy a plant, they look at the care guide and the care guide, you know, the card says water this plant once a week. And then because of their indoor environments, that plant actually needs to get watered every three days or that plant only needs to be watered every two weeks and they end up overwatering or underwatering the plant. So my biggest recommendation to you is don't just water your plants every Friday because that's when you're you're not tuning yourself to be sensitive to the plant. And this is where these genus episodes that we're creating are really helpful, right? Because calathea like evenly moist soil. So when the soil begins to dry just a little bit, I'm gonna water that calathea to make sure that that water stays evenly moist. And that could be once a week in my house. That could be once every three days in another person's house. That could be every day in someone's house. It also depends on the growing media that you have the plant in, right? If you compare that to a philodendron, which we just did an episode on last week, philodendron don't mind the top, you know, inch of their soil drying out or ficus. So you're going to water that ficus differently than you're going to water that calathea in terms of frequency. So in terms of frequency, it's going to go down to you understanding what plants you have and what type of environment that you have. And based off of that, you're going to understand when to water your plants. Another good rule of thumb here is never water wet soil, right? So if say you are used to watering your plants every Friday and one Friday you go and the wet, the soil is still wet, it's still moist. You don't need to water that plant again, right? That's when we're going to get into maybe waterlogging soil and root rot. So don't water wet soil. That's another good tip. And the other thing with frequency that can get really annoying is your watering frequency can change based on the season that you're in, if you're in an area that experiences seasons. So for me, in the winter, I have to water my plants more frequently because my plants are close to baseboard heaters and the baseboard heaters pump out heat and dry my terracotta pots out. So I end up watering my plants more in the winter. Some people will have to water their plants more in the spring or summer. What you'll usually see online is that you should increase watering in the spring and summer. If your plants are increasing in photosynthesis because there's more light availability and they're in your southern facing windows, you might notice that you need to give your plant more water in the spring and summer. Where for me in my personal environment, I live in a home in the middle of the woods in upstate New York. It gets very cold out. The heat is going to blast. I'm watering my plants more in the winter just due to my indoor environment and you know my heating system. So that's where frequency makes it tricky. If you struggle to understand what plants are right for your lifestyle and, you know, for the frequency that your lifestyle needs, you're welcome to go take my plant parent personality test on my website. You can just go to plantparentpersonality.com or growingjoywithmaria.com and it'll give you a list of plants that fit your lifestyle. So plants that kind of fit the frequency of watering that you need. So that's the when. If you struggle with knowing when to water your plants, take my plant parent personality test. I think that will help you so much because half of the battle is just picking the right plants that work for you. If you're someone who's going to water, you know, who really is very busy and has young kids or travels a lot and you really just want to water your plants once every two weeks, like Calathea are not going to be the answer for you (laughs) unless you have a full-time, you know, plant waterer or plant sitter or you put them in self-watering pots. So you can do that. Also, you can get yourself a moisture meter and I demo how to use this in the video companion on YouTube to this episode Moisture meters are probes that sense when soil is dry and when soil is wet. So you buy the moisture meter, they're like $11 on Amazon. You stick the moisture meter into the soil and that moisture meter will tell you how moist the soil is. Especially if you have big pots that go really deep that and you're, you have a ficus or a philodendron that can allow for the top soil to dry out. You can use the meter to go deeper into the pot to understand if maybe the bottom layer of soil is still wet. 
I also always like to suggest Growing Joy. I wrote a whole book on how to make plants, use plants as a wellness and mindfulness tool. But when you're checking your soil moisture, you can choose to use it to make a mindful moment out of, out of it or an unmindful moment out of it. So you could just jam your finger into the soil and, you know, take it out and see if it's cold or not or see if it's wet or not. Or you can take a deep breath. You can see how many of your senses you can engage at one time with your, you know, with feeling the soil. Is it cooler? If the soil is cooler, it's probably still damp or wet. Is it hotter? If it's air temp, if it's room temperature or warmer, it's probably dry. What color is it, right? Is it dark brown? That probably means it's wet. Is it, If it's light brown, it might mean that it's dry, right? So allow yourself a mindful moment when you are engaging and trying to measure the moisture of your soil, my sweet plant friend. General guidelines for most plants, with the exception of calathea, alocasia, and ferns, is you can kind of let the top portion of the soil dry out a little bit and then water again. But once again, you really do have to know your plan to understand that frequency. But that is the when of watering. So now let's talk about watering techniques. I've been caring for houseplants for almost a decade now, and I have learned a thing or two about watering techniques. To blow up my own spot, when I first was caring for houseplants, I thought that you could only water plants at night. And I thought that watering plants meant taking a mister and spritzing the leaves. Neither of those things are true. <laughs> Spritzing plant leaves is a great way to potentially get a fungal infection on your plants. And you can water your plants at any time of day. And if you're going to pick a time of day, it's better, I believe, to water them in the morning than in the evening. But you can water your, plant, your house plants whenever you want. So there's a couple of different watering techniques I want to talk to you about. The main one, which I'm going to say you should be using 90% of the time with your house plants, is top watering. So if you think about nature... Plants get watered by the rain in nature. That is essentially top watering, pouring water over the soil of the plant from the top and letting it seep in. We have a watering demo on the companion video for this as well, if you want a top watering versus watering demo. But here's some general guidelines for top watering. When you're top watering, I like to do something called, I call it blooming. So if you're a coffee person and you bloom coffee grounds, I give a little sip of water to let the top of the soil rehydrate before I give the soil a full drench. This is just because you don't want the water to go across the top of the soil and down the sides of the pot. And when you give just a little drink of water close to the stem of the, you know, the center of the plant, allow that top layer of soil to kind of hydrate an amuse-bouche of water before you give it a full drench. After you do that, you're going to give it a really good drench until you start seeing water come out the bottom of the pot, the drainage hole. So when you see that, the saucer is going to fill with water. You can let the water sit in the saucer for like an hour or so because sometimes your plant will actually absorb some of that water sitting in the saucer via capillary action. If you have a terracotta pot, the pot itself might also absorb some water, which helps for transpiration. Then after about an hour, the remaining saucer water into the sink or back into your watering can to use the next time. You want to water at the soil line. You don't need to water the leaves of the plant. So I love a watering can with a nice thin spout that can easily get under foliage. Another way that you can top water, which is a method I've recently used, they have these squeezy bottles you can buy online that I think chefs use for like sauces, but they have these tiny curved spouts and you can fill the squeezy bottle up and then you just squeeze it and it spurts out a, a, a thin stream of water. For smaller plants or for plants with sensitive foliage like African violets, that's a great option. I'll link to all these products in the show notes as well. Once again, I demo them on the video as well. But I think a skinny nozzle is going to really help you when watering plants, especially if you have plants that have foliage low to the soil because you want to hydrate the soil because the soil is where the roots are, right? So we're giving water to the roots to uptake. So we want to make sure the soil gets wet. Like I said, you're going to water thoroughly, but not frequently. The issue with watering not thoroughly, like just giving a little sip of water, is that the water doesn't go all the way down. The bottom of the pot doesn't hydrate. And we want to train our roots to go down towards the bottom of the pot to find the water and the soil because we want the roots to grow down into the pot so they anchor the plant so the plant doesn't fall over. So if you water too shallowly, you might just have shallow roots, which isn't great. So one of the issues that comes up with watering is when you have hydrophobic, is it called hydrophobic or hygrophobic? I think it's called hydrophobic soil. And that's where the soil has dried out so much, it's become compact. 
or compacted. And you'll notice when you go to water your soil, you when you go to water your plant, the soil has pulled away from the side of the pot and there's actually a hole in between the soil and the pot. And that water will just run right down the side of the pot, come right out of the planter and the soil itself will will stay dry. This is where top watering is going to be very hard. It's going to be very hard to rehydrate the soil top watering. And this is where you can use my other favorite watering technique, which is called bottom watering. I go through phases where I do this a lot and then I don't. I recommend, you know, top water your plants like 90% of the time and then bottom water your plants 10% of the time because there are specific reasons to bottom water. But just know that when you bottom water, the plant is uptaking the water and there's nowhere for it to go. So it can also uptake like calcium or deposits in your water that you don't necessarily want in your soil and in your plants. So if you do use the bottom watering method with your plants for a multitude of reasons, just make sure that every so often you're giving a good top water to kind of flush the soil out. So the way that you bottom water, you water from the bottom. You use a planter with holes in it and you fill a saucer or a bowl with water and then you put your plant with that pot with holes in it in the bowl of water. What happens is through this cool thing called capillary action, the soil is going to wick the water up and rehydrate itself. It's like magic. This is so fun to do with kids to teach them about capillary action. And it's so fun to see if you use a clear bowl like a Tupperware or something you're going to see the water line in the bowl go down as it gets absorbed into the plant. And I just think that's so fun. This is the way you rehydrate hydrophobic soil. This is the way I love to water tiny pots. I'll get like a big bowl and I'll put all my tiny pots in it. So I don't have to water each individual tiny pot. I can just bottom water all my tiny pots. And I use this method when I'm lazy. If I don't want to top water all my plants and I want to just throw them all in a big saucer of water, sometimes I use that. Bottom watering is also great for plants with sensitive foliage like African violets or any plants that have fuzzy leaves. If you don't want to get water damage to the leaves, you can bottom water. And like I said, I use this technique probably 10% of the time, maybe once a quarter, I'd say I probably bottom water most of my plants also just to make sure that there are no dry patches in the soil. So sometimes, you know, the whole pot of soil can get compacted or sometimes there's just some random chunk of soil that has dried out and it's really hard to rehydrate. So a good bottom watering can kind of rehydrate the entire pot of soil. So I will do that like once a quarter. You can also do this in your bathtub. So that's bottom watering. Alongside bottom watering, there's self-watering, which isn't a technique. It's, it's a pot. You know, it's a style of pot but you could get self-watering pots for your plants. They have a self-watering reservoir. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. The most popular is there's the pot that you have your plant in, and then there's a reservoir of water and a cotton string that connects the reservoir of water and the plant. The cotton string will wick the water up and then like release and hydrate the soil on an ongoing basis. So for plants like calathea or alocasia or African violets that like you know, even soil moisture, self-watering planters are great, especially if you travel. I have friends who have their entire plant collections in self-watering planters. One thing to note with self-watering planters that I personally struggle with is the water reservoir refill frequency is completely different than the way that you water all of your plants in pots. So what I found is I had a couple of plants in self-watering planters, but the water would dry out and I wouldn't notice. And then the plant would die because it wasn't getting any water, which is so the opposite of what it was supposed to do, right? And that's just me personally, but I'm just giving you a heads up. If you do go the self-watering way, make sure you set some sort of timer on your phone to remind yourself to check the water reservoir because they're more low maintenance, but they're so low maintenance that you could just forget about them, which is a problem. In terms of water temperature with watering techniques, Don't use freezing water. Don't water your plants with ice cubes. Our plants are from the tropical rainforest. They're used to 80 degrees, 90 degrees, 80% humidity. You do not want to shock their roots with ice. I don't know why that technique started. And I'm not shaming you if that's how you do it. Listen, I've had people tell me that they've been watering their plants with ice cubes for their entire life and it's been totally fine. And I salute you for that. Live your truth, plant friends. I'm just trying to give you as much information as possible. But what I have found is an ice cube is not enough volume of water to properly water a plant. And also just intuitively, if we're trying to recreate outdoor and, um, you know, if we're trying to set our plants up for success, they're not used to getting water with freezing cold water. So anyway, in my opinion, don't use ice cubes. 
Another technique for watering plants that I think comes with time. So if you're a new plant parent, just like trust yourself that this will come with time is understanding when your plant needs water by weight. So the way that you get really good at this technique is when you go to water a plant, when it's time, when your plant has dried out and it's time to water it, before you water it, pick the planter up. You're going to notice how much it weighs, right? Then water the plant. Once the water is hydrated, pick the planter up again, and you're going to notice that that planter, that plant is so much heavier when it's watered versus not watered, right? Because the soil is saturated and saturated soil is way heavier than unsaturated soil. So I am now at the point that I can walk around my plant collection and just by picking a pot up, I know if the plant needs to be watered or not. I don't have to stick my finger in the soil. I don't have to use a water meter. I don't have to put a reminder on my phone. I can just walk throughout my collection every day, pick up planters and say, oh, you need some water. You need some water. You don't need some water. You don't need some water, right? So this technique comes with time. It will come over years of practice, but I think it's really fun and a really interesting way to tune into your plant and get to know your plant on a deeper level. A couple of fun watering accessories that I wanted to mention. So there's the moisture meter, which is the probe. There's also a soil probe that isn't a moisture meter, but it has, it's a, it's very chic looking. It's a golden soil probe that has divots in it. So you basically insert it into the plant. And when you pull it up, it has a divot at one inch, two inch, three inch, four inch. And it pulls a mini sample of the soil from your pot. And you can see, oh, the top inch is dry, but two inches down isn't dry, right? So there's that. That's kind of fun to play around with when you're getting to know how to water your plants. Obviously, with a watering can, I personally like the biggest watering can I can find. I use the Modern Sprout bronze watering can because it's chic. It has a beautifully thin nozzle that I can get under any foliage, and it holds three liters of water. So I have 80 or 90 houseplants right now. So the less I can refill my watering can, the better sometimes. So I like that that's a really nice large watering can. Like I mentioned, there's the little sprayer. There's the little squeezy bottle that you can buy for smaller plants, for smaller pots, for sensitive foliage plants, which I recently have purchased and absolutely love. I'm having a lot of fun with that. And then I've seen multiple people online and I just ordered one for myself as well. There's these like pump sprayers. So they fit like a gallon or a gallon and a half of water and they have a pump on it, a long hose, and then a nozzle. You pump it and then you can hold it by the pump handle and walk around and water your plants. And sometimes the nozzles actually come with like telescope extenders. So say you have plants on a bookshelf or hard to reach areas, it makes watering your plants so much easier because sometimes if you have a big watering can like I do, like extending your arm to water a plant on a high shelf is hard because you end up holding that three liters of water. So this pump sprayer is cool because you hold a gallon and a half of water in one hand you hold the nozzle in your other hand and you're able to move the nozzle around in your other hand, which I think is really fun. That's next level. You don't need that. That's just if you're looking at, if you like toys, that's my new favorite toy that I've been playing around with. And then I just want to wrap this up by talking about why drainage is so important. So on an episode all about watering, drainage, which is more having to do with the soil than the water is so important because like I said, your plants need air as much as they need water for their roots to survive and be happy. And what I used to do is my first 10 houseplants, I had vintage teacups and vintage votive candle holders and all these vintage little glass things that I basically took plants out of their nursery pots and plopped in with no drainage, right? So what happened was I would water those plants. I was a beginner. I didn't know how much water they need. The water sat at the bottom of these glass reservoirs and my roots rotted out. If when I was a beginner, and at that point, I labeled myself a plant killer. I decided I couldn't keep plants alive and I didn't try plants again for three years. So I lost out on three years of potentially filling my home with beautiful plants and living a more joyful life. So if in my beginner phases, I just used planters with drainage holes, it would have made it so much easier, right? Because you just, you set yourself up for success when you have drainage holes, because if you put too much water in the planter, it runs out the bottom, right? So I really think using planters with drainage holes is such a wonderful way to set yourself up for success if you are a beginner plant parent or not. I'm not a beginner plant parent anymore. (laughs) I've been at this for almost a decade. I'm a professional plant lady podcaster and I still almost exclusively use pots with drainage holes. 
if you have a planter that you really love aesthetically that doesn't have a drainage hole, just put the plant in a nursery planter in a plastic pot and then put that pot in your pretty decorative planter. That's called the cash po method. Cash, C-A-C-H-E-P-O-T. Cat. So it's cache pot, which in French means to a hidden pot. So anyway, drainage is important. Set yourself up for success. I hope I answered all your questions. Watering techniques, the how, the why, the when of watering. If you have watering tips or tools or tricks that you think I missed, go to my Instagram page, Growing Joy with Maria, and comment on this week's Instagram post with your tips and tricks. I'm going to put out a call for action. And yeah, I'm still experimenting with other watering techniques. I'm currently experimenting with putting um, sphagnum moss on the top of my soil for my moisture loving plants to see if it helps retain moisture. I'll report back. I didn't want to include that in the full episode of this because this is still very experimental for me, but I'm always willing to learn if you have more things to tell me. I'm so thankful. Speaking of willing to learn, I'm so thankful to Proven Winners Leaf Joy for sponsoring this mini series, the Growing Joy with Leaf Joy mini series and supporting this podcast so that I can make content like this for you. Thank you. Go find Proven Winners Leaf Joy at your local plant shop or garden center. Ask for Proven Winners. Look for the Proven Winners Leaf Joy tag and let me know on socials what you get. I hope this episode was helpful. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, water your plants and remember to water yourself. Literally drink water and also figure out what areas of your life might need a little hydration boost. I hope you learned one or two new things on today's episode. And until next time, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.